James Street. Gstreamer developer, and she's been an, a participant in the open source community since 2004. Um, she's also an avid lover of ducks, so I've been told you should watch out for one in this presentation. Uh, please welcome Vivia. Uh, hello. Uh, so my name is uh, my my birth name is Paraskevi. You don't have to remember. My name is Vivia. <laughs> And uh, I will be talking about uh, basically video broadcast environments. I work, from a company, I work for a company which is based in Vienna. I work remotely. And uh, here you can see basically our uh, existing uh, legacy products, which is uh, not interesting. It's basically either uh, capture an incoming uh, video stream into a file or uh, grab a file that's uh, been, uh, or uh, grab a file or an uh, SDI input and play it back. Uh, this is basically aimed for uh, broadcast production, which is uh, changing lately. So, what is broadcast production? Uh, it's uh, what you see, or what you can imagine that's happening in the control room of some TV stations. So, we capture a stream which can be from a file. Uh, it can be from a camera. Uh, we capture that video. We manipulate it. We might want to change its dimensions. Uh, we might want to combine it with another video source, uh, encode it or whatever. And the, the other question is, where does, it, where does it go after we capture it? Uh, it can go into the hard drive. It can be. Uh, broadcasted to the uh, to the internet, it can be basically anything. So essentially, it's uh, the same as uh, what happens in uh, filmmaking. Uh, but uh, we don't use a, a physical film to to record it. We are using electronic means, and this is changing lately. So. Uh, in the, in the past few years, uh, video broadcast uh, industry has realized this new thing called the internet. And we have to take advantage of it because it can offer us a lot of exciting new things. Uh, the first thing, uh, they had those uh, bulky boxes that would do all kinds of uh, video manipulation and you had to connect them everywhere. We can get rid of those boxes and do some things in software. Okay, this is nice. And of course, we can do some more complicated things that we couldn't do before. Uh, however, we still have some legacy devices lying around here or there, so we need some interoperability because we need to be able to work with those as well. And uh, we, all, we might also want to in the interoperability because uh, uh, someone sold us an advertisement of uh, some fancy new device. Is that going to work with my setup or is it not going to work? We want it to work. Uh, also, we want it to be multi-platform. We don't want to be uh, inside this cage of this will work only with uh, that device or with uh, uh, that other setup. Uh, we, we want it, uh, to be able to use a different operating system, Linux too? Yes, why not? And while we are at it, we, we are dealing with many physically isolated locations. We have uh, one uh, reporter uh, currently broadcasting from uh, the war zone live. Uh, we want to switch to IP-based solutions uh, so that we can make all this work together without, uh, without needing to, like, uh, bring a cable, we have the existing infrastructure, we can take advantage of it. And oh, who knows what else one could think about one... Uh, the, basically, we can imagine new things and these things, we need to be able to do them. Uh, so, the development model in my company is that the first thing, we shouldn't need to reinvent the wheel. Second, other people we might need to work together or against, but they shouldn't need to reinvent the wheel either. So it's better for everybody if we keep the interesting parts upstream. 
uh, not only in uh, GStreamer, but we we use as many open source technologies as we can. We, our own code is something that's, uh, I wouldn't call it simple, but it's boring. There's nothing really challenging in there. Our main contributions are upstream. Uh, our uh, main challenges that we face, we've upstreamed them. So, okay. So, so what are the requirements of a modern video broadcasting solutions? Uh, requirements, you might also think of them as challenges. Why are the new solutions a bit more challenging? Uh, first of all, we don't know where the new source is going to come from. We want to broadcast a movie which is saved as a file in the hard drive. Uh, on the other hand, we are broadcasting live a news program. It's in our studio with our camera. Uh, but of course, as I said earlier, we have a broadcaster at a remote location, a reporter. We have to stream audio video from the network, which is coming from a, possibly a war zone. We want to add some user-generated content. Uh, for example, you have seen uh, people filming a disaster with a mobile phone, and suddenly this phone recording is being broadcasted on TV. So we need to be able to combine all those inputs seamlessly and overlay the station logo on top of them because we want to advertise ourselves. At the same time, we want to have multiple outputs. Uh, we want to use all uh, the old legacy SDI cables, I will explain them. We want to use them for our existing infrastructure. Uh, we want to stream it over the network as well uh, because we have a remote office somewhere else they need to be able to broadcast it as well. Uh, of course, we have a local preview. Uh, you want to see a preview of what's happening in your own screen, smaller maybe, and you want to see it uh, before, uh, without having to look at the camera or the, the screen. Uh, but in some scenarios, it might be network controlled. So this small preview, you want to also stream it over the network. And uh, the other thing is that we want to keep an archive of what's being broadcasted. So we see one more output. It's an output to a file for our archives. So what's this SDI thing? Uh, it's using these cables. You might think of them as analog cables. Yes, they are also used as analog cables. Uh, but when the industry went digital, they thought, okay, we can reuse these analog cables to pass a digital signal. Uh, it's a direct connection. It's not IP based. It's uh, transmitting uh, raw video and audio, unencrypted, just over the wire. It's uh, a bit like a high quality HDMI. The cables are very high end. It can support a higher bit depth than HDMI. And it's been, uh, uh, it's been made to support, it can support 4K if you have uh, four of those cables together. It can do uh, 3D stereoscopic video, it can do many more things. Uh, the reason the industry is still sticking to SDI, uh, first thing is that of course, uh, historical reasons, we don't want to throw away the existing infrastructure, we want to reuse it if possible. Uh, all this equipment that we paid a fortune for. But it's another thing, it, it uses a simpler cabling than HDMI. You don't have to worry about, oh, does this connector work? Does the adapter have an issue? This is much simpler and it allows for longer cable length. So this is one requirement and challenge. We need to get this into, uh, into the computer and manipulate it. And of course, inputs and outputs need to be able to be added and removed on the fly. What are we seeing here? We will get back to it later. Uh, but we see a pipeline where data flows from left to right. It's, I don't think the colors are very well up there. Uh, on the left, you have red boxes, which are inputs or sources. On the right, you have blue boxes, which are sinks or outputs. And we can see here, if you watch carefully, 
the data is coming in from two different sources. It's being combined in the middle, and then it's being split into two different sinks. So we need to be able to add and remove parts of this on the fly, because, for example, we are watching the news, and then uh, the presenter says, oh, now we want to connect to our uh, reporter, which is based at this time at the, the other side of the world. And suddenly, a stream is added. Uh, then we need to uh, play back something that's uh, saved on the hard drive, uh, because the user sent us a video. We add another picture-in-picture -picture with a file. This has to be happened seamlessly. And we shouldn't stop, we shouldn't see glitchy, the screen going blank or anything. Uh, we also need to be able to add and remove outputs. For example, uh, after the news there is a movie starting. We don't want to record the movie again, we have it. So we need to stop recording to the file while keeping the existing output running for the people to see. And we need to change essentially the topology of this graph without influencing the existing running parts. Another requirement or challenge is live mixing. You have seen it on the news. They are discussing an interesting topic. So the screen is displaying several people in several locations. Some of them are at the studio, but maybe they are using different cameras for each person to focus on the face. Some people are based on a remote studio somewhere else. You have a complicated picture-in-picture -picture setup, which needs to happen on the fly, and it needs to change on the fly. Uh, the screen shouldn't blink just because we need to add a new person. Uh, also, we need to take care of the latency. Uh, we have a uh, very small latency inside the studio, a higher latency with remote people, but we have to keep this under control when we are mixing all the video streams. And we, we of course, need to wait for uh, the mixer to... It has some uh, delay while it's processing, when it's uh, rendering the data. And we shouldn't pause and uh, let things look like they're buffering, like on YouTube. On the, bit, on the TV. And there's another challenge. Uh, the war zone is having a very bad internet connection and the image that's coming from the reporter is dropping some frames. What do we do now? Okay, there's nothing we can do. This uh, video stream is dropping frames. The rest should continue running smoothly. So now we can see on the image uh, it's essentially a nice picture-in-picture -picture setup uh, with some built-in patterns. Uh, ideally, we want to use the GPU for that. The GPU is made for processing images. Uh, it's made for uh, adding effects like uh, transition effects. Uh, we don't want to keep the CPU occupied for that. We need the CPU for other things. and. Uh, also, we need uh, to use the GPU for hardware codecs. Uh, for example, decoding uh, a highly compressed video stream it requires a lot of complicated computations. Encoding it also requires those computations. Uh, so, how do you see high quality video playing smoothly on the Raspberry Pi? It's using hardware codecs on the GPU. We want to use this codex if possible. And our favorite ducks. Uh, you can imagine watching a football game, but for now we are broadcasting this very interesting duck to the whole world from two different angles at once. We might be broadcasting a football game. Uh, the main screen is uh, showing where the action is made, and uh, at some corner we are seeing the overview. This has to be perfectly synchronized uh, because it's going to look very confusing if uh, on one stream it's showing the team A having the ball and the other stream is showing team, team B having the ball. People are going to start wondering what's up. We need those to be perfectly synchronized.
So for that, and for many other beautiful things, but these are the main challenges, we use GStreamer. Uh, so what is GStreamer? It is a multimedia framework. It's, of course, free software. Uh, so you use uh, tiny blocks that can do one specific thing and do it well. And uh, you combine these uh, reusable blocks into higher level data flow graphs. So what happens now is that uh, we are reading a file in this pipeline from the hard drive and displaying video and playing back audio on the computer. Uh, this is also dy dynamically reconfigurable. For example, here uh, the audio stops but the video keeps playing, for example, the audio part is going to disappear. Then we get another audio stream added and we want another audio branch to appear there. It's, it can be done, it can be dynamically reconfigurable. Think about combining elements like Legos in a certain way. And let's uh, look at some of the terminology of GStreamer. Uh, we have just a small pipeline for now. Uh, these little Lego bricks that can be used and combined are called elements. So uh, each element, each building block can do one specific thing. Uh, so some elements are sources, some elements are sinks, some elements are uh, filters, the data generally flows from source to sink. And sources get the data from, a, from a, an external location, from the hard drive, from the internet, from an SDI cable or whatever, and enter it into GStreamer. Uh, in the same way, sinks get their data from GStreamer and uh, show it somewhere else. And filters take the data and process it and uh, give the processed output. Uh, and uh, the whole pipeline is made of uh, these small building blocks, elements. The elements can be combined into bins. So of course the whole pipeline is also one bin, but small, inside we can have smaller bins that can do specific tasks. For example, uh, we want to play back a video file. Uh, for that, we use the top bin, it's a decode bin, it might be too small for you to read. But what is it, what's it doing? It's taking the video, it's finding what type of video it is. Uh, it might be, in this case, it's a uh, Matroska video. We have to find which type it is. Then it uses the Matroska DMAX to separate the video from the audio stream. Uh, and then it decodes the video stream and passes it somewhere else. This is a bin, it's a reusable bin because we need it many times that we want to decode a video. You see at the bottom an example that's uh, closer to the way, uh, to the requirements of our uh, broadcast pipelines. We have two different, the top uh, bin in a square is one input bin that's coming from a test signal. Uh, the bottom bin is another input bin. And it's getting its data source from a file. The data flows and on the right we have one output bin, uh, which is our uh, video image sync on the computer. So one bin can contain many elements inside, but we can handle them together as one. Uh, Dreamer also has uh, plugins in itself. It's a core framework. It's uh, just providing a simple API and it's media agnostic. It's uh, manipulating video and audio and uh, other data types, subtitles all the same way. Uh, it's uh, synchronizing the data flow. It's uh, handling the communication between the components. But of course, we cannot have a multimedia framework that's fully media agnostic. Uh, so, for uh, things like codecs, for things like uh, sources and uh, sinks and filters, for those things we have plugins. The advantage of that 
is that if we know we are only going to need this very specific set of features, uh, we don't need to hold, to, we don't need to hold, the, uh, to load the whole uh, batteries included uh, set. We can just load only the plugins that we are going to need, and the rest doesn't get in our way. So let's take a look again at this example pipeline. Uh, just to repeat, the data is flowing from the left, from the sources, into the sinks on the right. So we zoom in a bit on the inputs. Uh, the top part is an input that's coming from a video test source, and it's going into another, it's called video convert, basically it's converting a uh, for example, you can convert, uh, convert uh, color space from uh, one side to the other. The bottom part is reading from a file. It's demaxing. And uh, from the demax streams, it's uh, decoding the video. And it's going to another video convert. These are two, di two different inputs that we might use in our pipeline. Oh, then we also have mixers. These mixers take several inputs, two in this case, there can be more, and combine them into one. Uh, so this is the compositor input. It's taking two or more video sources and combining them into one. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, I didn't include audio in this pipeline. But of course, we have the audio mixer as well. But it, if you come back here and imagine another branch for audio, it would look at spider web. So let's keep things simple for now. And these are our two outputs. The bottom one is a file sync. It's being written to a file. And uh, the top one is uh, displaying things onto the Linux desktop. And GStreamer gives us uh, support for different kinds of inputs, different kinds of outputs on uh, Okay, the colors are just slightly different, even though they are very different on the screen. Uh, on the left, we have a, uh, one file source, one uh, HTTP source, and one decklink video source. Uh, on the right, we have uh, one file sync, uh, one decklink video sync, uh, SDI is decklink. I will explain that in a while. And one XV image sync, which is the Linux desktop video sync. So uh, the decklink cards are one of the main options in the industry for uh, capturing input from an uh, SDI source and putting it into the computer. And at the beginning, the GStreamer support for that was very basic. So these cards are not just capturing one single input and putting it in the computer. Uh, the, we can have several cards, and each of them can be connected to several different uh, sources. Uh, we need to be able to select, now I want to use this card, and from this card I want to use that input. Or now for the output, use that card and that output. Uh, we need to be able to switch seamlessly. Uh, we don't want to have a black frame during the transition. <coughs> Uh, also, decklink cards, uh, as, as we said, synchronization is very important. Decklink cards put timestamps onto the video and audio data they are sending. We, we want to be able to look at those timestamps, understand them, and integrate them into our own pipeline. And uh, they can uh, work better with mixers if these timestamps are accurate. One other thing uh, that has to be done with uh, these cards is modes. So uh, mode is a, usually a combination of uh, resolution, whether or not we use interlacing, and uh, frame rate. There are several modes. Uh, we can automatically select the correct one according to whatever the signal that's coming to us is. But we also need to be able to set it manually. 
if the incoming signal can, uh, can support several modes, uh, we should be able to delete, uh, to, uh, to enforce one specific mode. Uh, so, these elements, uh, these elements were rewritten. All these things that I'm talking about is now supported in GStreamer 1.6 release. And uh, by the way, these uh, same elements for uh, Declan cards are used in, the, in this conference in the big hall. They have a Declan card which is capturing SDI inputs using the elements that were uh, written for our own pipelines. One other thing that uh, GStreamer allows us to do is dynamic pipelines. We can add and remove outputs and inputs on the fly. We don't need to construct a pipeline in advance with everything we need and then run it. We take a basic infrastructure which is uh, always playing. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. So in our case, we use a black canvas that's being uh, redirected to a fake sync. Think about it as a DevNal device. We have this pipeline playing and then we start constructing uh, the inputs and outputs that we need and plugging them. So that was in theory. Uh, in practice, when we started using GStreamer for these use cases, it was much more complicated than uh, apparently anybody was ever needing it for in the past. So sometimes it would uh, freeze, it would crash, it would act up in uh, weird ways. So what we were doing is testing to isolate these issues. And after these issues were isolated, we would provide patches if we could. Uh, we would support upstream bug fixing if we could not fix them ourselves. So as I said before, live mixing, uh, it has to work with a given latency. We cannot wait forever uh, for our mixer to process these uh, 15 different video signals. Uh, so one thing that we did was to make mixers in uh, GStreamer work with a preset latency. And if they see that they cannot make it, we would prefer them to drop one frame and continue to the next rather than uh, stalling the pipeline. Uh, also, there are some hidden properties inside some elements that could have been configured but uh, were not really exposed anywhere. No, we expose them in this video convert element that I talked about before. And we can take advantage of those properties at the mixer to, to allow for better support of the incoming video. So one more nice thing about GStreamer, it's a support of OpenGL. Uh, so we can have uh, through OpenGL integration with uh, various hardware audio and especially video codecs. So these are especially important on uh, embedded systems like the Raspberry Pi, as I said. Uh, other elements are uh, the GL video mixer, which is mixing different video sources and uh, letting the GPU do the hard work. The GL image sync, which takes care of displaying the video frames. Uh, GL overlay, which can overlay one image or one texture uh, on top of the video signal. Uh, GL effects for various uh, 3D effects, the interlays. And we have contributions in the OpenGL stack as well. Uh, so the OpenGL 3 core profile was implemented. It's uh, a uh, new API, it's uh, completely cleaned, it's, uh, it can work more efficiently, and uh, we, we added support to that in the uh, upstream GStreamer. Uh, also, uh, the NVENC element in uh, GStreamer, which is a NVIDIA's uh, H.264 hardware codec. Uh, we are using the uh, GPU path of that through OpenGL, to allow for uh, H.264 uh, hardware accelerated video. Uh, also, 
pixel buffer objects, uh, which is a uh, asynchronous pixel transfer operations. Uh, so we need to give uh, one big set of pixels to the GPU. We shouldn't wait for the, for the transfer to be finished. We can let the data transfer uh, be asynchronous. And in the meantime, we have better things to do than to wait for it to be finished. So one tricky topic about the duck synchronization is the clocks and the timing on GStreamer. So what it does, the way it works, it takes a clock time. It can be the computer's hardware clock, for example. This is a monotonous source. This is what we will use as uh, our base for synchronization. The moment we go playing, we look at the clock time and says, this is our base time. That's zero running time. So the running time is how long our pipeline has been running. Uh, you can watch the same uh, file and uh, loop it uh, 100 times. The running time is going to be 100 times the duration of the video. Uh, however, we have another time, the stream time. It is essentially what you see up at the bottom of the video player. Stream time can go back and forth. It is essentially uh, for, uh, for a file, the position in the file in which we are. So you see this specific example? We played the stream until 100 milliseconds and then replayed. The stream time will go back because we see the, the bar, the little bar at the bottom is going to skip. But running time is always increasing. Uh, so how do we go from stream time to running time and back? Uh, so uh, at the beginning, when we start playing, we send out something called a segment. Uh, the segment is saying, at this position, we have this stream time and this running time. It keeps going. Later on, we might want to replay. We might want to seek forward. Uh, we might want to go fast forward, for example. Every time one of these properties is changing, we send out a new segment. So this is the new equivalence from now on. Uh, segments can be sent at any time. You don't, need to, you don't need something to change. You can just send out a new segment just because it would make things easier for a newcomer. So uh, there are several helper functions. You give them the segment, you give them the stream time, and you get something. And from that something, you can get a running time. This something is a segment position, but anyway. Uh, there were a lot of helper functions that were missing, and we added them. And we added the ability to extrapolate. For example, uh, this uh, position that you're giving me corresponds to something that's outside the segment, but it's okay. It's uh, 100 seconds before the segment, so uh, 100 milliseconds before the segment. So it's minus 100. Is that your result? Okay. Uh, it's easier to give something that can be extrapolated and then cut off the range that we, ne that we need than to not have the support at all. And of course, many unit tests were added because it's uh, very easy for uh, these calculations to go wrong somewhere. So now we have these unit tests, and if something breaks, we can detect it. So uh, how do we stream audio and video? Uh, there is the RTP protocol. Uh, it, can use, it usually uses uh, UDP. It can use TCP, but usually we don't want it because it's building up latency every time something goes wrong. It's uh, just uh, like the meme with Patrick, taking the stream from here and putting it over there. It doesn't care about anything else. Uh, we might want to monitor the quality of service. For that, we use RTCP. Uh, which is a control protocol for RTP. It's a controlling quality of service related parameters. We can change the codec or big trade if we see something that's going wrong. Uh, on top of that, we use RTSP. Uh, so for an RTP connection to be established, we need to manually specify several ports. Uh, send RTP, receive RTP, send RTCP, receive RTCP, so the question is, can't we just give one main port and let the rest take care of itself? Yes, we can. That's what RTSP does. 
Uh, it can also play and pose. And it can do network synchronization. Uh, so uh, the synchronization can be done using an externally provided clock like NTP or PTP. Uh, by the way, uh, we have done that at a party. If you want to, uh, if you want to display synchronized video and audio playback, you can use a RTSP with GStreamer. It, it requires a, some tweaking, but it can work fairly easily. So you know NTP synchronization, I guess. When you tell your computer, please fetch me the time from the network, it's using NTP. It's asking the server, what time is it? The server replies. So it's measuring how long it took uh, for the request to go and come back, calculates the latency of the network, and sets the time. Uh, what we added in GStreamer is PTP. Uh, in PTP, we have a central, for a local area network, uh, we have a central clock server. So the clock server is uh, shouting out. And now it's this time. And later on, now it's that time. Someone hears it. OK, uh, you said now is this time. But when was this now? So uh, the client sends to the server a delay request. The server can see that and send a, send a delay response to calculate the latency. So uh, in uh, GStreamer, I think it's uh, already in 1.6 as well, uh, we added the support for PTP clock synchronization for RTSP and overall. And other small improvements that we added, uh, this uh, new little element called video frame audio level, uh, it's essentially uh, showing how loud the audio is between two uh, subsequent video frames with frame accuracy. So these bars that you can see at the bottom left of the picture, it's not very well visible. But it's these audio bars that go up and down showing how loud it is, uh, but with uh, accurate synchronization frame, video frames. Uh, we also did sm another small element called uh, error ignore. If there is another downstream, just ignore it and say everything is going fine. It's useful for debugging. Uh, many documentation improvements, many crashes, deadlocks, other bugs that we were encountering, uh, we helped them um, be fixed upstream. Uh, okay, thank you for your time. Are there any, are there any questions? Any questions? I've got two questions. You mentioned Raspberry Pis a few yeah. times, so I wonder if you could talk about whether you are actually using those in a production environment or a test environment. Uh, no, Raspberry Pis are too weak to be used in a production environment. I just use them to demonstrate the effect of uh, CPU versus GPU because their CPU is very weak. Okay. And the other question is, uh, how big a team, how many people were involved in uh, Tools on Air in uh, making your contributions to GStreamer? Um, two to three people, depending on the time period. But uh, we are also cooperating with uh, Centricular, so they can uh, fix the most difficult bugs upstream for us. So I understand GStreamer does all the back ends. What are people using on the front end, say, when they want to bring a new camera and create the pipeline? So I guess what's the user interface that the people that are doing the mixing that are bringing the pipelines oh, uh, online? In GStreamer itself, you mean, or in our case? In your case? Uh, in our case, it can be as uh, simple as a, uh, a command that you run on the Linux server itself. Uh, but uh, what, we are, uh, what we are also doing is uh, uh, RPC commands or JSON commands that are sent over the network from a remote server for remote controlling. Um, can you talk a little bit about where it's been deployed and how successful it's been in replacing some of the legacy systems? Uh, it's uh, not a ready product yet. It's still R&D. But uh, as you can see, we have uh, already made a lot of upstream contributions, and they were worthy of their own talk. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Yeah, there was some of the video files you said so supplied all different formats and codecs are being used. What if they can't keep up with the live? Because I know converting video sometimes from one format to another format, it can't do it in real time. So how, how are you accommodating for that? Uh, usually, we try to find that out beforehand. Uh, so prevention is better. But in the worst case, uh, we can tell it to just uh, give up the coding, uh, drop a few frames, and uh, skip to the next key frame if you need to. Any more questions? Okay, well that was a great talk, Vivia. Thank you so much, and on behalf of LCA, I'd like to present you with this. Oh, thank you very Please much. Please join me in thanking Vivia again. Thank you.